Amen. The story I'm going to tell you has to do with a young nun who had problems relating to the older nuns in her convent. Have you ever had that struggle as a young person relating well to the older people that surround you? Well, it's an old problem. In 1897, a young nun died of tuberculosis in a small Carmelite monastery in Normandy, France. She was only 24 years old when she died. She had been in the convent for about nine years at that point. It was unusual for someone to join a monastic community at 15 years old, but she got special permission. And she had two older sisters that were already there. Now, this convent was filled with older nuns. And some of those were cranky old people from upper-class families who were always talking about all of what they sacrificed to be nuns. And, and they looked down on her because she was from a much less affluent family, what we would call middle class today. And so there was always that tension that she had with them. Now, this young nun wasn't an exceptional nun. She was quiet, but sometimes she fell asleep during the prayers. I can relate to that. <laughs> Some of you fall asleep during sermon. I'm uh, just, just saying. <laughs> but she was also kind, and she had a particularly brilliant way of explaining the things of God to the younger women who were joining the community. After her death, her family edited and made public an autobiography she had written. And they also had a document about her theology along with copies of letters she had written to priests all around the world. The young nun was Therese of Lisieux. And her autobiography is called The Story of a Soul. And that book has been read and admired by generations of people, people like Mother Teresa and Pope Francis. In 1997, 100 years after her death, she was made a doctor of the Roman Catholic Church. And that's a status of high honor that's only given to a very few people who have had an unusual mo amount of impact on the entire church because of their wisdom. She's the youngest person to ever have gotten that distinction and one of only four women to have received that honor. Her life has affected millions of people. Now, we expect great things of great people, but we have a certain image of what that greatness looks like. Our assumption is that the most important things that happen in society, in politics, in economics, in religion, come from powerful people, from well-known people, and from the mature and the experienced. We assume that it happens in big events, that it involves big money, that it involves elections and military power. But what if we're wrong? What if the most important things that ever happen in the world happen in hidden places, on the fringes of society, outside of the media spotlight? And what if the greatest things in history don't depend upon the greatness of the person, but upon the greatness of the God whom they trust? Or to look at it the way Luke is telling us. What if the most important things that happen in the world don't happen to elderly priests, but happen to teenage farm girls? We're in our third week of Advent. And last week, we looked at a moment that an angel visited Zechariah in the temple. And you would expect that a godly, a righteous priest would be ready for this kind of interaction, but he wasn't. 
The angel met him in his normal duties as a priest. He was totally surprised. He wasn't ready, and we never are ready. The presence of God is, in this sort of way, is always a surprise. But even though it was a surprise to him, it fits our expectations in certain ways. When we look at it, he was a priest, and the angel came and visited him in a temple, and that temple was in the most important city of Israel, Jerusalem. It fits our stereotype of power. An older, established member of the religious leadership is in a holy place and has a powerful experience. But this week, things change. Because today's passage begins with these words in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. God sends the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. God goes to the fringe of world society. It's Israel, not Rome, and it's Nazareth, not Jerusalem. He goes to the fringe of even Israel's society. God is ready to enter the world to change it forever, and he begins by sending an angel to a teenage girl in a country town. The promise made to Zechariah was that his son was going to be the one that prepares the way for God's son, the Lord. But God gives a promise to Mary through the angel that Mary is going to be the mother of of the Lord himself. So let's take a look at that. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 1. We're going to begin at verse 26, and we'll go all the way through verse 38, but we're going to take it in stages. Let's begin with verse 26 to 29. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Let's end with that. We're all familiar with this story. We've read it or heard it preached lots of times. The angel Gabriel comes into the presence of a young, unmarried woman in Nazareth. He brings an amazing message. This small town teenage girl is highly favored by God. God is with her. Now, according to Luke, Mary was a young girl, probably junior high, high school age person. She's a teenager. And right from the start, we're dealing with the unexpected because God is beginning to answer promises that he's made for thousands of years to send a Savior into the world to change all of human history from that moment on. And yet he chooses someone who's not even old enough to have a driver's license. Think about what happens here. God uses a perfectly powerless person with no status in society because she's poor and she's a woman. She's not, she doesn't even have power within her family because she's a child. Yet the angel doesn't say to Mary, go ask your father for permission. That's not in the text. He doesn't tell her, Go and discuss this possibility with your fiancé, Joseph. Not there. It's not orderly. It's not going through the right channels. It's not fitting our expectation of the kind of person God should be choosing. God is dealing with Mary directly. He's making this awe-inspiring promise that embraces all of human history. He's making it directly to this teenage girl. The greatness of the moment is not in the greatness of the person, but in the greatness of the God who's making the promise. Just as we would expect, Mary is greatly troubled by this moment. 
Having an angel visitor in your living room is not expected. And just as in every other angelic visitation, the angel says, don't be afraid, calm down, you'll survive. And then what happens that follows in these words are some of the most amazing words ever spoken. And we're going to take a look at that beginning at verse 30. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you've found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm still a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Well, this word comes to this young woman. And since we talk about this so often, I've thought about the other times that I've preached about this or taught about this. I've focused sometimes on the specifics of the promise, all the details. Other times, in most years, I focus on the amazing capacity of Mary to believe this and respond to this, her capacity to trust God. Today, I want to focus on one of the more fundamental things about this passage, and that is that the words of the angel are a promise from God. Everything it describes has to do with what God is going to do in the world. Through this promise, God is, is inviting Mary into his story. Mary has her own story, and it's in a little town, in a little country, and, and it's a story that was thousands of years ago. But in this moment, through a promise, God is inviting her into his plan, his purposes, and she's invited into something that changes the world forever, and we still remember and celebrate today. By the invitation, she's invited into this. But notice that invitation. It's a promise, not a command. God is speaking to the eyes of faith, not to strength, not to wisdom, not to human will. The angel sets before her an amazing picture of the world that God's bringing and how God is drawing her into that plan. Look at the details in this passage. You will conceive and give birth. He will be great and called the Son of the Most High. He will have the throne of his father David. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The Holy One will be called the Son of God. For no word from God will ever fail. These are all promises. In fact, the only command in this is that she shall name him Jesus. And even that means God saves. God invites her through a promise. Now we know how this story turns out. Here we are 2,000 years later telling the story because God fulfilled his promise. Here we are 2,000 years later, living our lives in response to an event that happened in a country town on the eastern edge of the Mediterranean. God fulfilled his promise. That's the only reason. The greatness of the moment is in the greatness of the one who makes the promise. Now, amazing 
Mary makes an amazing contribution. And what makes her great in her her own right comes in verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Mary believed God and submitted to his action in her life. That's her contribution to this moment. She had no details about how it would play out. She had no assurances that it wouldn't hurt along the way. She had no roadmap, and I'm sure she had her own set of doubts. But she didn't trust the details of the plan. She trusted God who made the promise. It's a unique event. It's nothing like this is going to happen again. And yet this dynamic of God making a promise to us that we then believe and submit to his work in us, this sort of interaction is core in the Christian life. God has made us a promise, for example, that in Jesus we are forgiven. It's not something we can earn. It's not something we can do for ourselves. It's not something we don't need because of some power we have to be good enough. God does something gigantic and eternal, and it's something that human power, even through organized religion and politics and economics, something humans can't achieve. God deals with evil at its most fundamental level and lays the foundation to erase its power forever. And that's one of the things we wait on in Advent. We wait for that day that Jesus brings that when he comes again. All we can do is believe it and submit to God's action in our lives. But it's not just these huge, big, invisible things where God makes us promises. This sort of promise and response is the basic fabric of the Christian life. The basic Christian life isn't a matter of how resolved we are to do what's right. It's not a matter of how smart we are and how quickly we understand Bible passages. It's not a matter of how powerful we are and how willing we are to use that power for God's purposes. It's a matter of promise. God makes commitments to us, and he's asking us to simply believe it and to submit to his action in our lives, to submit to him working out an agenda in us. And he he gives us a sense of this through all the promises that we find in Scripture. There are lots of promises there that apply to the daily life and not just to the biggest picture. Call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you will glorify me. That's from Psalm 50. That's an important verse to me. There have been times that I have felt like I haven't had the power to change my situation. And yet I was in trouble. And so I would call on God and wait for his deliverance. And so this is one of those moments where I then glorify him by saying he did deliver. Give and it will be given to you, pressed down and shaken together. The the enormous generosity of God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Something we need, a promise we need for every day. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. That's buried in one of the books of Peter. And then it follows and it says, through these, he has given us his great and precious promises so that through them we might participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. That's a promise. It's all one big, gigantic promise that God has given us everything we need for the life he calls us to. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which passes understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's a promise for day to day. 
And there are hundreds, if not thousands of them. And the thing about a promise is it describes something God commits himself to do. It's not about what we can do. What we do is believe the promise and submit to God's action in our lives. The whole dynamic here that we're talking about is summed up in verses 37 and 38 in our text. The promises that the angel makes ends with, for no word from God will ever fail. And Mary responds, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. That's the dynamic promise and response. So I've shared one that's important to me. I'm coming down here and ask some of you, what has been an important Bible verse? You don't have to quote it perfectly. You don't have to know the reference. But what's a Bible verse, a promise that you've held on to? Now, let's make sure it is a Bible verse, not just something you heard from Oprah, okay? It's, it is a church service. So anybody, any, just take a few. Somebody who wants to share a Bible verse, a promise you've held on to. Yes. Let me make sure this is on. Okay, it's on here. So um, when my grandfather died, he had, um, before he had taught me the verse John 3.16, and I carry that as a promise. I say it every night before my parents take me. All so. right. That's a good one. John 3.16, you can hardly get better than that one. Okay? But we still want other people to... first verse I remember hearing growing up at this church, I didn't really hear much from God, but when I moved to Los Angeles, I remember hearing clearly God saying, Paul, Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. Yeah, be still and know that I am God. Okay? Any others? I don't want to make this a competition, but the other service had a lot of people. <laughs> of course, they're the people who get up early to go to church. My God shall supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yes. When I first came to faith, this was written on the back of my Bible. This is uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I think. Uh, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new is come. That's foundational. <laughs> yes. Okay, let me come around. Take one or two more. Psalm 103, he renews my strength like the eagles. Okay. Isaiah 41.10. Oh. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. Okay. Two more here, and then we're done. Ephesians 2.10, be the kind of man that Christ expects you to be. Okay, yes. It's a theme for a whole ministry. Some of the very first passages are verses I memorized. As a new Christian, even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Amen. Lots of important stuff there. And that's for day-to-day -day life. The important thing to understand is that in this enormous moment in history and in our daily life, these things are linked because the the, the prime person at work is God. And we respond to what God's doing. Now, this kind of belief and submission isn't just one gigantic step that happens in our lives. Now, there is a big step that happens in many of our lives. We have testimonies about that. When we believe God and submitted to his work, to his action in our lives for the first time. We call that conversion. But even if our life has a big yes to begin it, it's followed by a lot of little okays along the way. Every day, over and over again. And all of these little ways we say okay to God along the way might look small and might look insignificant, but they draw us closer into what God is doing in the world. 
Therese called herself the little flower of Jesus. And she led a quiet life in a small convent. And she lived that life for less than a decade before she died. She wrote letters. She had conversations. And she served the few people around her. There was nothing big. There was nothing special in what she did. There was nothing big except that God was with her. There was nothing big except that she believed God's promises and submitted to God's work in her life, and that made all the difference. Now, there might be some places where God is making a promise to us right now. Not just general promises, but specific promises given to us. And maybe we're ready to believe it and submit to God's action in our lives. Maybe we're ready to let God work in us in new ways through his Holy Spirit so that we step deeper into the amazing things he's doing in the world. So even if we're a teenager, even if we're on the fringes of things, even if we don't look anything like the person, the kind of person that changes things, God might be making a promise to us. God might be asking us to be sensitive to something that he's doing, to be part of something much bigger. Sure, you have doubt. Sure, it'll be confusing. Sure, you won't know exactly how to respond to something that where God, somebody wants to give you a medal, and that's not part of our tradition. But are we sensitive to God blessing and wanting us to give blessing? Where are we in that day to day? And if we're not ready right now, if we're not listening right now, God will be patient and he will continue to be there. He will continue to ask. He will continue to plow. And amazing things can happen when we say yes.